Thomas Muyombo is a Rwandan uh, man, father to five kids and a husband to one wife. Uh, I am a medical doctor and I'm also an artist in different genres of art. I'm a musician, I write books, kids' books, and I'm also an illustrator. I do art. So I write books, I also draw some illustrations to complement uh, the stories. Part of the job that I do as a medical doctor, I work in RBC. I am blessed to head the blood transfusion service. So um, what we do in the blood transfusion service, part of it is mobilizing people, uh, carrying out campaigns to inform the general population about blood uh, donation so that we can have enough blood in our blood bank that we can give out to hospitals whenever there is need. So that was what I did through my social media, through my Twitter uh, account, uh, calling out to the general population to, uh, to come and donate. We had a dire need of uh, O plus blood and uh, it was, um, it, we were supposed to do that campaign to raise the stock for all. So that's what we did and the response was very good. Even as we speak right now, in hospitals, someone is being transfused. And uh, there has never been any invention for a machine that produces blood. So for someone to be uh, transfused, they need someone else to donate. And this has to happen even way before that person needs blood so that we can have time to test it, then uh, process it and ensure that it is safe for transfusion. So uh, this is something that has to happen all the time because there is someone who needs blood all the time. So uh, there was some particular need that drove uh, the need for that campaign. Uh, like I said, there was some uh, more utilization of oil, which exhausted the stock for oil because we normally do estimates uh, in order to avoid any kind of shortage, we, uh, we, we estimate how much we are going to need in a particular time, depending on how much blood is going to be requested. Uh, and we arrive at that from the previous requests, from the experience that we've been having. And whenever there is some unusual requests and unusual utilization of a particular blood group, so we always have to do something additional to what we are doing in a normal situation to ensure that this increase matches with the increase in uh, the, 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 the blood collection to maintain our stock and also to maintain the supply. So that's what we did. It has to happen all the time. Not the campaign, but what the campaign helps is to uh, increase knowledge to also inform people that uh, there is need for blood so that whoever might have uh, time, might have the will, comes to our blood banks and donate. Because it's us human beings, it's us Rwandans who have to donate so that our fellow Rwandans, one of us, because each one of us is a candidate to, 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 to receive a transfusion, so that Whenever there is a request from the hospital, we don't lose someone out of the fact that we did not donate to plan and prepare for the request. We have different sites, mobile blood collection sites, in uh, almost each uh, cell across the country. And uh, from each site we have 
donor representatives, uh, at least five from each of the mobile blood collection sites. Uh, we have around uh, 2,500 to 3,000 donor representatives because they keep on increasing depending on uh, uh, the need. And uh, we, we, we also have five regional centers for blood transfusion. There's one in Kigali, one in the south, which is in Huye, one in the north, which is in uh, Musanze, another one in the west, which is in Karonji, and uh, uh, one in the east, which is in Guamagana. So each of those five regional centers have an annual plan of where they're supposed to go uh, in their catchment area uh, on a daily basis to collect blood. Like I said, as we speak, someone is being transfused. So there is a certain number that we need to have to distribute to the hospitals in order to meet the daily demands. So this daily demand needs to be matched with the daily yield of blood that we get from the field. So this um, number of units are divided to each of the regional centers and they are given targets that they are supposed to meet on a daily basis. So it's something that we do on a daily basis, like I said, but whenever there is something that comes uh, and disturbs our estimates, our plan, that's when we conduct a specific campaign directed to correcting this abnormal uh, utilization of blood for a specific blood group. Because the one that we conducted was about blood group O, which is normally the blood group for many people. Around 45% uh, of the Rwandan population has O. Uh, around almost 50% they have O. And uh, since there are many, that's the most blood group that we are supposed to have. And it is the most blood group that is being, that is, that is uh, transfused in the, in, the, in, the, in the hospitals because that's the uh, group where you're going to find many patients because they make up the, the largest part of the population. So that's what we do on a daily basis. And uh, some campaigns tend to come in depending on which type of blood is needed, which type of blood is being overutilized. And uh, because diseases and uh, sicknesses are not selective, they don't even plan with us. Uh, they don't say, you know, this particular group of people is going to be sick, Pre prepare for that. We only prepare depending on the previous experience, but something un un unexpected can happen. So when something like that happens, that's when we conduct a campaign. I'm contracted by the government to work for some, some, some hours. There's a law that provides for that. And beyond that time, the other hours I am left with, I can easily use them for some other um, things that I'm uh, more subscribed to do. Uh, for example, uh, doing music doesn't require a certain set of time, like uh, it, it is required to work in the government. For example, working in the government, you wake up in the morning, there's a time to arrive at work, then uh, you have a break in between, and then there's a time to end work. Then from there, I'm free to go to the studio. Mm. Then from there, you know, I have a home office. From home, I can do some other things, like writing, some like illustrating. So I also have weekends, even though um, as a supervisor at my work, I work all the time, but it's not all the time that I'm supposed to be there, standing on top of people or like on their neck, uh, directing them what to do. I always love to uh, make people work without needing a lot of supervision and with that I achieve 
the best result and I also get enough time to also concentrate on being innovative at work and also to do other things whenever I'm able to. So, uh, like I said, a day has 24 hours. I work for 10 hours a day and the other 24, I have time to sleep and to do other things. <laughs> Right now I'm working on my album. I've been working on, uh, I've been working on, uh, on several projects. And uh, from the last time I released an album, I've, I've, I've done two albums already. There's one that I released uh, by releasing singles. And there's another one that no one has ever had a song from that album. It has taken a lot of work and uh, a lot of investment because uh, what you need to know is that music also takes investment. So uh, for you to do a very good music video is millions of francs. So to have three, four, five music videos, that's a lot of money. So it takes money and it also takes time to come up with something that can sell. So I'm currently working on that album, which I think will surprise many because it's a new part of me that people have never heard before that I think is going to change the way people have been looking at random music, not only at my music, but as uh, the whole industry because uh, it will like, it will bring out the best that people have never seen, which I also believe many other Rwandan artists have, but don't show because of, uh, of the way our industry is built, the mindset of the people and their fears. So I'm going to do that. And I believe once it works, it's going to help many artists. It's going to change the minds of our fans, our promoters. As a doctor, I've always been doubted by, by people before I even begin working. But that one is very simple because um, once people give you time, they end up uh, knowing you, knowing what, how you do things, what you do. And that has uh, motivated me to work even, to be even better in what I do. And uh, so I don't, I don't consider that as a challenge because it's not all the time that you're going to find a medical doctor who is a musician. So it's in order for someone to doubt me, to think that as I come to work, I'm going to be putting on some headphones, singing, I'm going to pause at some point and then uh, sing or dance at work. So it's very, easy someone to pretend to know you because they know you from a screen because they've read about you someone knows that maybe you have you have a family you have four kids they also pretend they know those kids they also pretend they know your life they pretend so it's very easy for someone to judge you before even getting to know you so i don't consider that as a challenge i consider it as a blessing to prove to people that uh, uh, it's not good to pretend without even taking your time to know someone. Uh, so I can't take that as a challenge, but it's very common in an artist's life. In my life, it's very common. Um, the only challenge is that, you know, sometimes as an artist, you have uh, a very big dream which doesn't fit in the budget that you have. Because doing good things doesn't uh, only take talent, it also takes investment. So it's the same challenge that many other artists have. So we are lacking that in Rwanda, in our industry. Uh, we've had words of support. We've had parts on, the, uh, on, on our backs. 
but we've never had real investment in terms of cash. We've never had anything like that from the government or from uh, the private sector. So everything that you see is almost from each of the artists. So that to a certain point limits creativity because there are some things that you think you can do, you believe you can do, you have the capacity to do that, but you're limited by the financial capacity or your financial muscles because you need to get an investment so that you can have something of quality that you can put on the market to compete with other people. So that's the biggest challenge that I've had. I've never gone to a studio and tried to compose a song and then I don't get the words. The words are always there. The concept is always here. But being able to match the concept that I have with what I can get out of my budget are two different things which are a big challenge. It was an encouragement to people who have not been able to have kids uh, because of the culture, because of uh, how people have been raised to think. They believe that once someone has grown, they have to get married. And once they are married, they have to have kids. So we've lived to experience other like realities in life. For someone to be successful, if they are a woman or a girl or a lady, it's not a must that they should be married. Or if they are a gentleman, it's not a must that they should be married. And once they are married, it's not a must that they should have kids. Sometimes you can want to have kids, but your body doesn't allow. Then you don't have to, 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 to torment yourself, to torture yourself, to punish yourself. And no one has that right to also punish you for not having kids. It's something that we don't have control over. Sometimes you even plan, I'm going to have four kids, you end up having one. You end up having two. Sometimes you plan, you're going to have two kids, you end up having five. So. Uh, the fact that someone is born is not controlled by even their parents. For example, uh, you, can, you can decide to have kids, but the, before they reveal to you that you're, you're carrying, for example, maybe a, a girl or a boy, you won't know. And before the kid is born, you don't even know their face. If you cannot decide on that, then it's not you who controls the fact that you're going to conceive and have carry the baby. So if you can't control that, then you can't boost. At one time, I, I, I remember tweeting something about that, something like that, that no one should boost about things they don't have control over. So if you are born and you found yourself uh, in a certain family, you didn't do anything to find yourself there, then you, should, you shouldn't kill your, 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 someone else who doesn't have the same privilege. You should be thankful that you, you had that and you shouldn't judge others who didn't have that. You can only judge someone if they cannot do something while they are provided with all the resources and they don't. But you, you, you also don't even need to, to, to judge someone in that way because we've now come to realize that there are some other things that are, that are out of control uh, that go with the mental status of someone. You might look at someone, you think they are okay, but they are having some mental problems, mental illnesses that limit them from doing some certain things. So as someone who have come to realize that, so we came up with that song to encourage people. I have a few friends who don't have kids. I've seen some who have had one and have tried to have more and have failed. And uh, I know many more who don't, who have not yet even been married. So it was like an encouragement, but also a lesson to people to stop judging others out of the fact that they did not get things that they don't, they don't have control over. I can't control the fact that I'm going to have a kid next year, 
because I can want it, I have a wife, but try to make her conceive and I fail. And many people know about this. So that's, that, that's what the song was about. And uh, it was a partnership I had with an organization called Mark Foundation, which uh, does campaigns about the same subject across Africa, actually across the, 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 the world in different uh, continents. And uh, it was translated in different uh, languages. I did two versions, one in English, one in French, and they made other translations with different other artists. Uh, I think it's a talent that I grew up and I found myself having. Uh, from primary school, uh, I used to draw for our biology teacher. I used to even, I remember in primary three or four, I used to, to help our art teacher to prepare the art exam for, for, the, for the lower class. You know, I was in P4, I would prepare an exam for the kids in, in, the, in the lower class, in P3. And uh, from there, it was always something that I did whenever I was bored. Even in class, I would find myself drawing during class time. When the teacher was there explaining, I ended up drawing because that's when I concentrate on hearing what other people are, are saying. If I'm not drawing, I'm maybe tearing up a paper or that's how like I concentrate. So I ended up developing it like that. And uh, during my high school time, I, I attended some competitions and um, I don't remember winning. I only won once and it was an essay competition. It wasn't even art, but uh, I was no, known for, for drawing. Wherever I went, primary school, high school, and then uh, the fact that I'm I'm an artist, like my, my main ta talent is not even singing, and I don't believe it's drawing; it's creating, creating, creating something new. And uh, anything that requires creating, then I can fit in. So from that, I was able to now start writing stories. Uh, from experience, uh, from what I read, uh, or from seeing how others write, because I've never had any kind of training uh, on writing. But uh, I've been able to have several books approved by Rwanda Education Board to be used in schools. I currently have more than 60 books already approved for use in schools. Yeah. Actually, they are, they are now 80. Writing as a professional, I started in 2016. But before that, I could do it. I, I partnered with a, a few people in the past. And uh, before I even went to university, I had written four books. And uh, I was paid to do that. Yeah, for those, those ones, the first ones were for grown-up people, for grown people. And uh, by the time I completed university, uh, people didn't know it, but I tried to, 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 to self-employ. I, I went for a year without working at the hospital. I was trying to write kids' stories and then develop animations because that's something that I saw that was missing. And by then I had my firstborn. And uh, from my observation, I found out that there were no locally made content. And I thought that I needed to raise my daughter as a Rwandan, not as, firstly as a Rwandan, then as a global citizen. So I looked for local content, there was none. So I tried to, partner with people, but the capacity, I ended up discovering that the capacity was very limited and it required a lot of money to be able to produce that locally. So that's when I now moved and concentrated on only writing storybooks, which can become like 
uh, which is the first step of getting the cartoons. Because before animating, you need a story. You need an illustration from which to develop an animation that you're going to animate and then come up with a story, an animated story. So um, that's how I got into it because I wanted to contribute to my, my daughter's education and my other kids' education and then also contribute to other kids' education in Rwanda. And the good thing about it is that it, it's cross-cutting. The story that sells here can sell in any other African country. Can even sell outside Africa because some other people are interested in knowing what happens in the other part of the world. So. It's something that I discovered along, along the way and then inspired me to write more and put in more, more efforts. I like fiction stories because I want kids to think out of the box. I don't want them to read normal things, things that they can see uh, and then uh, without even needing someone to write about them and then uh, I can't waste my time doing that kind of story. I only do them because sometimes it's what the market requires, uh, but I like uh, creating things that kids have never seen so that I also help them to be creative. I believe that before someone becomes an artist, they first become human. We are human beings before we even become artists. And uh, gender-based violence happens to our colleagues. I don't want to limit it to, uh, to women because we've come to know and to learn that men also face that. But it's more on women. So, uh, I've had many feminists uh, fighting uh, uh, the, 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 the expression of uh, saying that, you know, these are our sisters, these are our daughters. We need to treat them rightly because they are human beings and they deserve it. It's not something that we should, you know, do to them because we have you know, we are feeling sorry for them. It's something that every woman deserves. I can assure you that in every man's life, there is a woman who has been instrumental in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in creating them into a man they have become. I'm very much sure. Any, any man, they, are, they, they only, um, uh, tend to mistreat them, to ignore them out of, uh, out of selfishness, out of um, coward, cowardice. Because you, once you've solved the issue of women, you've reduced competition, you know? Once you, like, you restrict them to the kitchen, it means at work, you're now left with little competition. That's how I say it. Because I've seen, like my daughter, my firstborn, is one of the cleverest kids I've seen. She's even cleverer than I was when I was a kid. And she's not limited because she's a, she's a girl. She can only be limit, limited by the number of opportunities that she's given. Once she has all the opportunities, she can become whatever she wants to become. And that applies to all the girls, to all the women. So uh, it's the message I was passing across, uh, not just because I'm an artist, and I don't want anyone to do it as an artist or to do it in the, in the image of what they do as, as a job. I want anyone or everyone to use the opportunity they have, but to do it as a human being. Because once you do it like that, it's not political. I don't want anyone to hear these words as words that are being spoken by a musician. I want them to be heard as words from a human being 
that's when they are going to be uh, perceived in the way that I want them to be perceived. So if someone is an artist and they are watching this, let them use that platform that they are given. Let them use that opportunity, but let them do it as human beings, not as artists. Do it as a human being. Look at a fellow um, lady or gentleman as a human being. That's when you're going to learn to respect them, to treat them the right way. Because uh, I, I have three daughters. If this goes on, then they are going to face that as well. But I don't want to do it because I want to save my kids. I want to do it because it's the right thing to do. Anyone who does um, violence to a woman, who does violence to a man, is doing something that is not right. And uh, it can happen to their direct uh, relative, to either a daughter, to either a mother, to either a sister. They are sometimes going to mourn one of theirs who has suffered because of uh, gender-based violence. So it's something that we should fight, not because we are, you know, feeling sorry for the other um, side because they are weak or something. We should do it because they are human, they deserve being treated the right way. Maybe something I can as well re uh, reveal is that this is going to be a very big album, at least from what I expect. And from what people who have been able to listen to it have, have uh, testified to me. Because I've been working with several producers on this album. I've worked with a team of uh, musicians, with a team of vocalists, with a team of videographers, and each one of these people have testified to me that this is the best album that I've ever produced. So, I plan to release it and uh, to be able to push it uh, in terms of promotion and then do concerts thereafter. I don't want the concert to overshadow the music itself. So when I release it in Feb, I plan uh, to either have several listening parties and then after people listen, after they share the music, after they fall in love with the music, that's when I will be planning to do uh, concerts for the, for, the, for the album, maybe in the summer of next year. Thank you.